Okay, hello everybody. Um, I'm going to be presenting on Tikhonov's theorem, um, which states that the arbitrary product of compact spaces is compact. Um, I'm going to go fairly quickly because I do want to get to the actual proof. I think it's a very interesting proof. So let's begin. So um, the idea of how we're going to prove Tikhonov's theorem is we're going to use the closed set formulation of compactness in lieu of the open set formulation. So if we recall, a space X is compact if and only if for every collection script A of closed sets in X having the finite intersection property, the intersection A of all elements of script A is non-empty. So we must have the condition of the intersection of all elements of A in script A being non-empty. And if we show that's true, then we show that the space is compact. So, I want to start off by motivating this idea by considering the product of two compact spaces. In this case, I'm going to choose x1 and x2 to be the closed interval 0 to 1 in the reals. And then I'm going to define script A to be a collection of closed subsets of x1 and x2, of x1 cross x2 that has the finite intersection property. And then we're gonna consider the collection of the projection mappings, pi one of A. Um, so we're gonna choose the points X1 and pi one, the closure of pi one of A, and X2 and the closure of pi two of A. And we want to show that X1 cross X2 is in the intersection. Because if we show that, then we show that the intersection is non empty, we have compactness. So, the problem with this idea is that we could find cases where we make a choice of x1 and x2 that doesn't work. So, I'm going to show an example here where we could find or we could choose a point x1 and x2 such that the, uh, pro the product of x1 and x2 are not in the intersection. So if I let script A consist of all closed elliptical regions, regions bounded by ellipses that have the points P equals one third, one third, and Q equals one half, two thirds as their foci, I can make a choice for X1 to equal one half and X2 to equal one half. And if I make that choice, just pictorially, I can see here that I could find an ellipse that doesn't contain x1 cross x2. And if that's the case, then clearly the, the cross product of x1 and x2 is not in the intersection. So therefore, we have a case where uh, the space isn't compact. Um, so, like I said, the idea is examples can be made to make a wrong choice. Um, so the question is, how can we be made to make the right choice? So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to construct a new collection, I'll call it script D, that forces that correct choice. So we can absolutely get an intersection that's non-empty. So to do to construct this collection, we're going to need Zorn's lemma. Now, Recall that Zorn's lemma states that let A be a set that is strictly partially ordered. If every simply ordered subset of A has an upper bound in A, then A has a maximal element. So if we use Zorn's lemma, um, we could construct this collection that has no larger collection that has the finite intersection property. In other words, if I show that script D is non-empty, certainly um, script A is non-empty, or the intersection of, script, uh, of A's and script A is non-empty uh, because the intersection of D's and script D are non-empty. So this, this leads to our first lemma. So this lemma 37.1 um, states basically on how we're going to construct this script D. So I say, let X be a set and let script A be a collection of subsets of X having the finite intersection property. 
then there is a collection script D of subsets of X such that script D contains script A, and script D has the finite intersection property. And no collections of subsets of X, script X, have that properly contain script D has this property. So all this is saying is that script D is the largest collection with the finite intersection property, which is very important. So how do we use Zorn's lemma and how do we show that script D or there exists a collection script D that has the largest collection of finite intersection property? Well, to do this, we're going to define a superset G that contains all the collections of sets with the finite intersection property as elements. So that's when we use Zorn's lemma. So we define our partial order on G, and then you can show that script D, there exists a maximal element script D uh, by inclusion. So that's uh, how you could show that using Zorn's lemma. Um, and that, that leads us to lemma, lemma 37.2. So lemma 37.2 is kind of an inspection on once we construct this collection, that's the largest collection with respect to the finite intersection property, um, what kind of properties does it have? Well, it has very two very important properties that are gonna be essential in actually proving Tichinoff's theorem. So one, it states any finite intersection of elements of script D is an element of script D. And two, if A is a subset of script X that intersects every element of script D, then A is an element of script D. So if I wanna prove A, I'm gonna consider a set B that has a finite intersection of elements of script D. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna let a new set E be the union between script D and B. And then if you just show that E is equal to script D, you're done, B is in script D and you're good to go. For B, you do something similar. So you define E to be script D union A. And then if you show E has to find an intersection property, then you have also shown that A is in script D. So those are pretty straightforward proofs um, and fairly short. Um, finally, I mean, that's all we need to you to prove Tichinoff's theorem. And it's not even that long, the proof itself, which I find to be astounding. So theorem 37.3 says Tichinoff's theorem. So an arbitrary product of compact spaces is compact. So I'm going to let X be that space, an arbitrary product of compact spaces. And then I'm going to let script A be a collection of subsets of script X script x of x having the finite intersection property. So to show compactness, if we show that the closure and intersection of the closures of A are not empty, then we're done. Now, the reason why we choose the closures of A is we want to guarantee that uh, those sets are closed. Because um, if you remember, um, the closed set formulation requires uh, those sets to be closed. Um, so using lemma 37.1, so that's basically saying script D is the largest collection of, uh, of sets with the finite intersection property. We could just, if we just show that's non-empty, then the intersection of all the closure of A's are non-empty since the intersection of the closures of A are a subset of the intersection of the closures of D. So we're gonna now just focus on showing that um, this is not empty here. And once we show that, we're done. <clears throat> so, so we're gonna consider the collection pi alpha of D, the projection mapping pi alpha of D such that D is in script D. So clearly the collection has the finite intersection property because script D does. If it didn't, then we possibly couldn't say that script D has the finite intersection property. So since each X alpha is compact, we choose a point X alpha for each alpha such that X alpha is in the closures of the projection mappings of pi alpha of D. So this is just a choice we're making. 
And then we're going to construct this point to be x equal to x alpha, where alpha reaches in the index set. And what we're going to try to show is we're going to try to show that this point resides in every uh, set of the closure of D. And if we show that, then the intersection of the closures of D are obviously non-empty. So to start this out, I'm going to take the sub-base basis element, pi beta inverse of UB, containing X. So we're defining U of B or U of beta to be a neighborhood of X beta. So since X beta is in the closure of pi beta D, it's uh, intuitive or obvious that U beta intersects pi beta of D at some point, pi beta of Y, where Y is in D. So uh, we can't conclude that uh, um, U of B intersects U or pi beta of X. We can't conclude that, but we know at least that the neighborhood U of beta and does indeed intersect pi beta of y for some point y. So from this, it implies that y is actually in the, the sub-base element pi beta inverse of u beta intersect d. And from that, we conclude, since d is arbitrary, that the sub-basis element must intersect every D. So if the sub-basis ele basis element here intersects every D, then by B of lemma 37.2, I'm going to go back up. By B of lemma 37.2, we can conclude that this basis element or sub-basis element is an element of script D. So that's uh, great. So now we know that the sub-basis elements containing X are elements of script D. Now we're going to use that and use the understanding of how we can relate basis and sub-basis elements to use property A of lemma 37.2. So since basis elements are unions of finite intersections of sub-basis elements, it follows <clears throat> excuse me, from A of lemma 37.2, that every basis element containing X belongs to script D. So in other words, we have this, we have our basis elements being unions of finite intersections, and we know that any finite intersection of elements of script D is an element of script D. And since we know that the sub-basis elements of containing X are elements of script D, it follows now that every basis element containing X belongs to script D. Now, since script D has that finite intersection property, we now know that every basis element intersects every element of script D. And since, uh, um, since every basis element contains X, it intersects every element of script D. We know that X must be in the closure of D for every D in script D. Therefore, the intersection has to be non-empty. And we proved that um, the space X is compact. And that's it. It's a very short proof, a very beautiful one. Thank you. And thank you for listening and uh, have a good day. <laughs>